I'm really thrilled to in introduce to you Tobias Leonard. Good to have you here, Tobias. Thank you. Um, he's the founder of the uh, Ethical Vegetarian Alternative in Belgium, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're here today to share your strategies with us mm -hmm. uh, and uh, talk about one of the hottest topics of today, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that is how we can go about to veganize the world. So I'm going to give the stage to you okay. and uh, have a lot of fun together now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My microphone is on, right? Yeah. Okay. Good um, afternoon, everybody. So this talk is... Um, is about veganizing the world. So it's, um, I'm supposing that you're already interested in veganism, you're already vegan, you're already vegetarian. You are interested in advancing this cause to uh, another level, all right? Uh, just a few words about me. I founded um, the uh, organization Ethical Vegetarian Alternative in Belgium. So that's a vegetarian vegan organization. We have uh, 12 paid staff people. And uh, this um, year I left the organization to work on myself uh, and uh, I didn't want to like have to deal with all the leadership and the coordination and uh, being responsible for everything uh, any longer and um, so I started uh, myself and um, I moved a bit uh, my, my domain of action I moved it a bit this was me before I spoke to consumers to meat eaters about why they should stop eating meat and uh, now I'm doing this I'm speaking to uh, mainly to activists or to people who are vegan already, about how to more efficiently talk to uh, consumers, all right? Um, <coughs> and I do that because um, often I see that uh, the way we talk to people about veganism, about animal rights, is not um, effective. And I'm thinking, like, you can do it a lot better. Uh, and I'm not saying I found, uh, like, the ideal way or I'm the best person or the best vegan ambassador you can find. But um, in 15 years of experience, I've... I think I found some things uh, that are important for the movement and that I'd like to share. Um, I blog on veganstrategist.org and I'm writing a book right now which should be out next year, is, which is called, uh, for now, uh, How to Veganize the World in 30 Years. <coughs> what I'm going to do in this talk is, uh, after an introduction, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the situation that we're up against. Uh, then I'm going to, talk about going to talk about the why, and the why is like the, question, the, the motivation that we give people about why they should change their behavior. Is that animal rights? Is that health? Is that something else? Uh, after that, there's the what, and the what is the message. The message is like, uh, what do we ask of people? Do we ask them to go vegan? Do we ask them to reduce meat, etc.? cetera? Um, and uh, the how is actually the subject of another talk that I'm not giving today. Um, <coughs> Before I start, as an introduction, I always emphasize that um, you have to uh, suppose or assume that we all have the same great intentions, that everybody of us wants uh, a world that's a lot better for the animals, where animals are not killed or not, don't suffer or are not uh, eaten. Uh, but we may differ in the way we approach this. We may differ in terms of strategy. Some people have completely different ideas about how to get there than others. And we should appreciate that, and we should not call uh, the other people who have a completely different idea, we, we should not say that they are selling out, or that they are like betraying the cause, or whatever. Okay, so um, on the other hand, we also should take into account that, we, um, uh, that not all strategies are equal, and that we have limited time and resources, and that we should put our time and resources and our money in uh, the things that we think work best and that research shows work best, okay? So the, the thing that works best, that's where we should put most of our researchers in, I think. So what do we want? We want a vegan world. This is a, a, a so-called foodscape. It's a, it's a landscape made out of food by an American uh, photographer. You see, like, uh, there's broccoli there and there's, like, fruit in the, in the, in the air. And this wagon is made of, uh, of bread. So this is a picture of... Uh, uh, I see everybody wants to take a picture of it, but you can find it better online. Um, a picture of a vegan world. Um, and that's where we want to get. But at the same time, that's not enough. We want people to move from meat eaters to vegans, but that's not the only thing we want. We also want them to move on a scale from no ethical motivation to an ethical motivation. And if you look at our movement, 
and I'm representing the things that we don't really like in the animal rights, the vegan movement, with a lightning bolt. So these are things that we don't really like. We don't like, we're not satisfied when people go vegan uh, or vegetarian like once a week, Meatless Monday. We're not satisfied when they are like um, demitarians, like half vegetarians. We're not satisfied when they are like vegetarian or veganish because then they still make these exceptions, etc. And we're not even happy when they are vegan for reasons of variation or health or environment. We're only happy, or the animal rights movement is only happy when they are vegan for the animals. Does that ring a bell? Do you have like that kind of thought of have you met people who are like that? I don't think we have to insist on that. Um, and my three key messages are, uh, we don't need to talk about the animals all the time. We don't need to, uh, to ask people to go vegan all the time. And what is efficient is a matter of the time in the history of our movement, in the evolution of our movement. Okay, so I'm going to explain these things and these things even though I'm saying this, this is still with the idea of creating, building a vegan world. All right? uh, <clears throat> maybe you know this quote by Jeremy Bentham. The question is not, can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? So I made my own variation of this quote. The question is not, am I right or is this my truth, but, that, but does this work? Does this work is the most important question you can ask if you are committed to changing the world for animals. And <clears throat> it's a very important question because um, the challenge that is ahead of us is very big. It doesn't look very good at first sight. If this is the meat consumption today, this is the meat consumption or the animal products consumption that is expected in 50, uh, by 2050. And that is mainly because countries like India and China are eating more and more meat because they're getting richer and richer. Okay. Um, Maybe you're familiar with the three ends of justification by Melanie Joy. Um, I've added two more ends, so there's five ends. Animal products are normal. People think that this is the most normal thing in the world to eat um, animals or animal products. They're natural. We've done this for ages since we were living in caves. They are necessary for our health, people think. They are nice, they're yummy, they're tasty. And they are not the worst, the first thing we worry about. Not the first thing that people worry about in terms of like they all, they have all kinds of other problems. I mean, from their own problems, like uh, their bills to pay and their weight and their um, health issues and their family troubles, etc. From other social issues like uh, the environment, uh, climate change, and um, the refugees, and all kinds of problems are competing for their attention. So we cannot expect of everybody right now to take this issue like as a top priority and to just drop everything and, and, and follow this issue. This question, it can be answered in a lot of ways. One of the ways to answer it, why do most people eat meat, is most people eat meat because most people eat meat. Most people eat meat because they see other people eating meat. And even if they think that there's something wrong with this, like, especially with this like industrially raised, raised animals, industrially, industrially produced meat. There's something wrong with it. I, I, when people think like these animals are suffering, and then they see like 95% of the people doing this, doing, the, doing this and eating these animals, they must think like, okay, well, then it's maybe not so bad if everybody's doing it. I I'm, I'm maybe have wrong thoughts or something, you know? Everybody's doing it, so it must be okay. Um, so we have to make... Uh, critical mass of enough people who say this is not okay. But the problem is that for most people it looks kind of like this. Like, um, who, who of you is, is vegan in this room? Most people, yeah. Um, I don't know how easy or, or how difficult it was for you, but I think for most people it still looks like this. Like if you tell them you are vegan and they say like, what do you eat for God's sake? Um, so there's a, like a huge distance between them and this uh, vegan concept. It's very much swimming against the stream when you want to go vegan or when you are vegan. And um, I describe it like this, compassion costs too much. If you want to be compassionate with animals, you know you will have to change a lot of things. You know you have to change your diet, your lifestyle, etc. So you know if you allow yourself to feel this compassion, you will, do, you will need to do a lot of things. So it, it's costly. It's a costly feeling in terms that like you have to do a lot as a result of it, if you want to be consistent with yourself. So I don't think that... Um, going vegan is easy for everybody. It's definitely not uh, for everybody um, that it's easy. There are people for whom 
I mean, they do it from one day to the other. I needed personally, I needed 10 years to do it. Be between the realization that I shouldn't eat animals and the moment that I, w I went vegan, it took me about 10 years because I loved uh, eating meat so much because of so social pressure, etc. And because uh, the food wasn't that good at that time, etc. Um, and if you doubt that, if you think that being going or even being vegan is, um, is easy, uh, you have to take into account that um, unfortunately the vast majority of vegans drop off the wagon at some point. 70% of vegans stops being vegan after a couple of years. Okay, so it's not, it's really not easy. Um, we have to make it a lot easier still. Um, so how do we get here? And this is first of all about the why. What do we say to people about why they should change? Okay, this is my why. Sorry for the graphical image. This is like why I do it. This is, um, I want the suffering and the killing to stop. And this is a moral reason, okay? A moral, an ethical conviction, a moral reason. But uh, apart from that, apart from moral reasons and moral factors, there's also non-moral reasons. Imagine that you are, you're not a vegan or a vegetarian and you're walking around in India and you see like this meat hanging on the carts, on the stalls in the street and it's not disgusted and there's flies on it and it's, it's not refrigerated and it's disgusting and there's flies on it, etc. And you say like, Ugh, I don't want to eat this. Um, and you decide while you're in India to go vegetarian or vegan because there's all this great vegetarian food over there. And at that point, you're not following any moral reasoning, okay? You don't have an ethical reason to do that. It's just like an aesthetic or a health reason, all right? So we have moral and non-moral factors in influencing people to change their behavior, okay? The moral factors are like how there are all the arguments we use, how are animals treated? They have to kill bef be because if we want to use them, we, we have to kill them. If we want to eat them, uh, there's the environmental arguments, there's religious arguments, there's world hunger arguments, all kinds of ethical arguments, and we use them everywhere, in our books, in our conferences, in our leaflets, in our newsletters, etc. And next to that, there's also non-moral arguments, like the mere availability. Can you imagine that if... if meat alternatives were very much available that people need a lot less of these ethical motivations. Um, and we have non-moral tools. We have restaurants and shops and uh, products and cooking lessons and apps and all kinds of things. And in our movement, we focus very much on the moral reasoning, on the moral factors. And why is that? Because we think it works. That's one thing. If you look at other social movements, other social justice movements, like the anti-slavery movement, a lot of us will think that slavery stopped because at some point we became convinced of the fact that it was immoral to hold slaves. And that's certainly true to a certain extent. See, there's, this is like a, a leaflet, an, anti, uh, an abolitionist leaflet, and it says three millions of, our of your fellow beings are in chains. That's a moral argument. People said, like, okay, th these are our fellow beings, they're the same as us, and we cannot put them in chains, we have to liberate them. Moral argument. But this wasn't enough to liberate slaves. What happened at the same point was, for instance, the invention of the steam engine. And the steam engine made it, in a lot of cases, cheaper to use mechanical, automized labor than slave labor. So holding slaves, using slaves for a certain um, task became more expensive than using machines. So can you imagine what a disruptor that was for slavery? Can you imagine how that changed things? And the second factor was that slavery was ended by a war. The South and the United States didn't just say like, okay, slavery is wrong, we have to stop it. No, they were conquered in a war by the North. And that's why slavery stopped. That's why it ended, okay? But still, we, um, we do focus a lot on these moral arguments. And that's also because like, we want people to do the right things for the right reasons. We want them to care about animals, about ethics, about morality, right? And a lot of the times, um, especially in the animal rights movement, health vegans are looked at with a kind of suspicion. They're like, hmm, these people, like these health vegans, they can like drop off the wagon any time, they can go back to eating meat any time. People are, they're, they're not really entirely trusted. Okay, so um, this is Gary Yurovsky. I don't know if you, if you know him. So, see, this is like a, a, an opposition between health and ethical vegans. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to explain why, it's, why this reasoning or why this motivation is not that important. So, at this point, compassion costs too much, like I said. And the lower, the, the less 
alternatives there are and the less their quality is, the higher the effort required to go vegetarian or vegan. Okay? Compare this with, um, uh, an, um, with planes. I could tell you like, that uh, flying a plane is unethical right? because it emits so, so many uh, CO2 uh, greenhouse gases. And um, so I could tell you like, you cannot use the plane. But suppose you have um, family in the United States and you want to see them. What is your alternative? You can use the boat and it will take about 10 days or something. And it will be more, exp I don't know if it's more expensive, never done it. Uh, but you can use the both, and it's not very much of an alternative, isn't it? So the, eff the, the motivation you have to have, the ethical motivation has to be very, very high. All right? Let's take this and the other way around. If you have a lot of good, tasty, in our case, tasty alternatives, cheap alternatives, affordable, healthy, etc., alternatives, your de the required effort becomes much lower. Let's look at um, how it is in our movement. Um, suppose that this was the only thing you could eat for the rest of your life, water and bread. Who among you, the, the vegans among you, who would still be vegan if this was the case? There's al always some very staunch vegans. Um, and I, I believe you, and I probably I would be the same, but uh, let me rephrase the question. Would you have gone vegan if this was the only thing that you could have found at that time? I don't know. I think a very few people would have gone vegan, like maybe a monk, you know, one person. But imagine then that like 20 years, 30 years ago, we discovered macrobiotic cooking and we discovered like we can combine these uh, grains and uh, legumes, etc. We can have decent vegetarian vegan meals and a couple of more people could turn vegan because it was easier. And then we got like really great meat substitutes, tofurkey, etc. And even more people could turn vegan. And then maybe in a couple of years, um, maybe some of you don't like it, but we might have lab meat. And it's identical to the normal meat that we find in the stores. And still more people go vegan because it's so easy, because it's so convenient to do it. And you don't need any ethical motivation anymore. Compare it with like a, this person who, um, who is jumping, uh, who is pole vaulting. And we can talk to her, to her head, and we can say like, come on, you can do this. You're strong, you're the best. You, can, you have to train more, and you can break the record, etc. You can like, give her all the required motivation. What can we also do? Can you tell me something else that we can do? We can lower the bar. Very good. We can make it easier for her to jump. Of course, in sports, this doesn't work. But uh, in, in our topic, we can lower the bar. We can make it easier by making the environment more conducive to her becoming vegan. And we can actually lower the bar so much that in the end she doesn't need any ethical motivation anymore. Can you imagine that there would be a world where um, people go vegan without any reason, without caring for the animals? What if going vegan didn't require any motivation at all? What would we think? A lot of us wouldn't like it. We wouldn't really like it because we want people to have this ethical motivation. But there's good news. Most social movements, when they want to act for change, when they want to like, influence people and make change, they start like this. They try to change people's attitude. Like they say, like, there's so many animals being killed and, and so many trees being cut, etc. And then they hope from giving people that information that people ch their attitude changes about animals. And then, as a result, their behavior changes. So like that. Okay? But we know that it works in some cases, but very often it doesn't work. There's a big attitude behavior lap, gap, it's called. Um, this is a, a, an illustration uh, for a research done uh, among ethics professors, professors in morality. And they were examining if they, if they were more likely to put their beliefs into practice. And so one of the things they examined is like, do you believe that we should be vegetarians? And of all the people who said yes, there were few who actually were vegetarian, ethics professors, morality professors, right? So they were not more likely to follow up on their beliefs, on their convictions than uh, normal people, than non-professors. So another way to put this is awareness is overrated. We always talk about raising awareness, but awareness is not enough by far. So apart from this, we also have this approach. We influence behavior first and then attitude change follows. And that's a very important thing that's often forgotten in our movement. A very uh, 
obvious example is uh, how some laws, in, in, in cases of some laws, like when uh, seat belts, obligatory seat belts were introduced in the US, uh, many people didn't like that at all. And they introduced them anyway, it was a law, they had to do it, people had to wear seat belts. And a couple of years later, they interviewed the people again, and most people were in favor. So what happened was, behavior changed first, attitude change followed, right? Look at this. If you, um, can you imagine that, um, can you imagine these two people are doing the same thing? They're both killing cows. Which of you do you think a normal omnivore, a meat eater, would be most frustrated with and most angry with? This one, right? The bullfighter. Why is that? Because it's not normalized? Yeah. Um, the way I would put it is that, um, I mean, there's different answers you can give. You can say, like, most people, a lot of people would say, like, this is, like, um, more frivolous. This is, like, not for survival or something. It's, like, a game or entertainment, and this is, like, for food. Um, but the way I put it is, like, that people are invested in this, involved in this, and they're not involved in this, right? So... For instance, here in Sweden, you don't have bullfights and you're not watching bullfights, I presume. Uh, so you have a culture where this is not common at all. So because you're not involved in it, you're not participating in it, it's very easy for you to judge this as bad. But people who eat meat, as most people in Sweden here do, will have a, lot, a, a much harder time judging this. So if you're involved in something, it's much more difficult to judge it. All right. So this is another example of like behavior comes first. You're not participating. That's your behavior because your culture doesn't have it. And it's a lot easier to judge it. Okay. Another example is like, this is like a, 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 an experiment by experiment, experimental uh, psychologists. They asked um, students to write an essay about the cognitive, the mental capabilities of animals. And to some of these students, they said like, when you've written this essay, you will get a meal. And to some they said, like, it will be meat meal. And to others they said it will be a vegetarian meal. And they saw that the people who were promised a vegetarian meal, they attributed a lot more capacities to, uh, uh, mental capacities to animals. Do you see what's happening? So they, they already knew that they were going to eat meat, so they, like, adapted their beliefs in writing to what they were going to do, to their behavior. Um, <coughs> so the other way around, if you already eat vegetarian now and then, it's a lot more easy to change your attitude as a result, behavior first. So we usually think like this, the more people care about animals, the more people will turn vegan. But it also works like this, the more people eat vegan, the more they will care about animals, right? So that is behavior first. Let me give you... Uh, a couple of brief examples about what is happening in the world of meat alternatives. This is Patrick Brown, who is inventing the impossible cheeseburger. It's a burger so real that it actually bleeds a little bit. It bleeds from the heme iron in meat. He's a chemist, and he wants to like build the ideal meat substitute. Um, and his, his company was offered $300 million the other day, a couple of weeks ago, by uh, Google, but he didn't sell. This is uh, Josh Tetrick with his company Hampton Creek. They're trying to like take the chicken out of the food chain. They have a motto or they, they have a little video where they say like, what is the problem is that we made the bad thing the easy thing. So eating badly, eating unethically, unhealthy has become very easy. And we have to make the good thing the easy thing. Okay, so they want to make eating well, eating cruelty free, so very tasty and so easy that people will do it. And then they will change their attitude. These guys are trying to invent, invent or reinvent milk. Not like soy milk or almond milk, but like real milk, nutritionally, chemically, almost the same as real milk. So it's high-tech food, so some of you may not like it. But imagine the disruption if this were in the shelves, and they believe it can be in the shelves in two years. Um, so if people could have like milk that is exactly the same as cow's milk, and hopefully the same price, etc., maybe even healthier, um, why would you still need to breed cows for milk. Um, so it's called moo free, free of moo, right? Um, cheese, you could make cheese on the basis of that milk, so real cheese. 
Um, this guy is Andras Forjak. He's making, um, he's trying to make uh, lab cultured leather, cell cultured leather, so leather from cell cultures. And this guy came in the news five years ago or something, Mark Post. He developed like the first uh, in vitro meat burger. Uh, and uh, it was um, it was said at that time that it cost $250,000 to uh, develop. He believes that within five to seven years, this could be on the market. Okay, so what may happen is that these products that meat eaters or animal products consumers like so much, we could still have them, but without the animals. So this could be like a real game changer. And this has never happened before. The, the, the technology that we have today and the money that is being poured into it, this never happened before. Uh, another couple of, good, of, of nice examples, Native Foods Cafe and uh, the Veggie Grill in the US, these are two like vegan chains, and they, want to have, they, they both want to have a couple of hundred uh, uh, restaurants in the next uh, 10 years or so. So this is like a McDonald's, but a bit more expensive and better. Uh, this makes it a lot more convenient to eat uh, vegan food, right? Cinema, Cineholic is a, is a cinnamon bun uh, bakery, and people go there not because the cinnamon buns are vegan, but just because they're very good. And these two, they want to have dozens of uh, stores in a couple of years. So to recap, um, going vegan right now is still swimming against the stream. You can have moral and non-moral factors. The higher or the better the alternatives, the more available the alternatives, the lower the required effort. And attitude can precede, um, can uh, follow behavior change instead of preceding. So the what? The what is about what are we going to ask to people? Is it going to be go vegan? Most people think like, um, yeah, it has to be um, go vegan. And we can ask this like in a nice way. You can say like very sweetly go vegan or we can like uh, uh, have more, um, more aggressive ways of, of putting it. Um, <clears throat> but it still remains the same message, however you phrase it. And we think we have to say go vegan because, I mean, it's logical. Like if you want people, if you want a vegan society, you have to tell people to go vegan. And also, like, maybe if you tell people, like, uh, reduce your meat or participate in Meatless Monday or something, then maybe you are, like, telling people it's still okay to eat a bit of meat. And we don't want to say that. We think it's not ethical to do so. Okay? Um, I think meat reduction as a message and meat reducers are extremely important for a vegan world. Why is that? <clears throat> First of all, people are more likely to do something when you don't ask too much. If I don't want you to fly, I, I probably will have more luck if I tell you, like, please don't fly short distance flights, don't use the plane for short distance flights, than if, if I tell you, like, you, ne you can never fly at all anymore. Okay? Secondly, the reducers may become vegan. Most of the time it goes like that. I mean, people roll into it. They don't, like, go vegan overnight, cold turkey. Most of them don't. Okay? Thirdly, the meat reducers together reduce more suffering than the vegans. Why? Because there's many more of them. Vegans are still 1% of the population only. The meat reducers are like 30%. So together they save more animals. And most importantly, a lot of meat reducers together, I think that's the fastest way to tip the system. And with tipping the system, I mean that the system changes so much that it completely reverses and it becomes all of a sudden a lot easier. It's snowball effect. So <clears throat> let me illustrate this last point with uh, a comparison with the gluten-free phenomenon. I believe like you have gluten-free um, also here in, in, in Sweden, like in, that in the last five years or so, it's, it, it really took off and it's like that <laughs> all over the world uh, for some strange reason. And maybe you know that on the one hand, there's like these people who are really gluten-free, really intolerant, and they cannot have any gram of gluten, and they have no, cannot have any contamination with something that has gluten, or they will get really sick. On the other hand, there's these people who like think it's good for them, and um, they avoid gluten, but they're not so they don't need to be so strict about it. They're not like gluten intolerant, and about them, science says like it's like it's no use that they do that. It's, it doesn't have any advantages. So they say that, that these people are fakers. Um, I, I'm not here to judge like the people who are like glu gluten free, but um, what is interesting is that like I found this on, on um, a woman saying on Facebook, because of all these gluten free fakers, for me as a really gluten f gluten intolerant person, it becomes a lot more difficult difficult in restaurants to explain that I really cannot have any gram of gluten because all these other fakers they're not so strict about it, right? But on the other hand, she says, thanks to all these fakers. 
I have a lot more choice in products. So what happened is that when this hype came about, a lot of people demanded these gluten-free products, and all of a sudden it became interesting to cater for them as a market, as producers. And look at our movement. This is the vegans, this is the vegetarians, and this is the meat producers. Who do you think producers of meat substitutes cater for in the first place? It's not the vegans. It's the meat, meat producers. And you can ask any vegan company, except maybe the very small niche companies, uh, but uh, most of them will tell you that their prime target audience is the meat producers. So it's thanks to them that if it's easy for you to be vegan today, that's thanks to them. Because they were the drivers of the demand and still are the drivers of the demand. Okay? So they make it easier for everybody to go vegan. And it's very interesting because they're such a huge group. So next time you hear about meat reducers or you're confronted with a meat reducer as a vegan, don't roll your eyes at them. They're very, very important for strategic reasons. And if you would agree that meat reducers are important, it's important also to look at their motivations. And while the motivation for most vegans is animal rights, ethics, morality, for them, for meat reducers, it's more about health and taste, culinary variation, doing something else, trying something else, and then environment, and then only animals. Okay, so we have to take these reasons into account. It means we have to take these motivations into account, I guess. So I started by saying that um, we want the world to be vegan, but we want people to be vegan for the right reasons. Remember, we want them there. We want them vegan for the animals. But what I think, what I believe, is that um, if you look at... Um, you have to take into account the demographic, the size of these populations. So there's very few vegans. There's more people in, in this demographic, veganish and vegetarian and demeterian. And there's a lot more people still who are like trying to like uh, avoid meat once or twice a week. Okay? And there's more people who do it for health and variation than for no reason. So it's really interesting to target these groups. And what happens, and this is most important, is as the choices increase, becoming stricter gets easier. So when we influence a lot of people to go reduce vegetarian, to reduce their meat consumption, which is a lot easier to get than increasing the number of vegans, these options will increase, and for everybody, slowly but surely, it will become easier and easier to become vegan. And also, as these people eat vegan for whatever reason, for health reasons, because they like it, whatever reason, their defense goes down and their compassion can grow. Right? So they, will, they would move to these ethical reasons, and we will get there. We will get people to care about the animals and be vegan for the animals. Only, I think, it's going to be a lot more indirect, but faster that way. Okay? So what I am suggesting is that we have, or there is room in our advocacy and in our movement for a very pragmatic, non-moral approach, um, which is about reducing, which is about reducing for any reason, about increasing skills, cooking skills, etc., uh, and a focus on the environment. I mean, the environment not as nature, but the environment that around people, like what is in their environment, what options are there, and making it easier for them. And then the other, the more traditional approach of animal rights organizations, for instance, is the more ideological go vegan approach, like for the animals, become an activist, uh, the focus on the anti speciesism, etc. And um, I think these approaches can be coexisting together. And uh, people who choose that one shouldn't like blame these people and not the other way around. These can coexist even within the same organization sometimes. Okay? But what I think is that um, if, you, if you see this, the red one here, and this is the blue one. I think the red one is most important now. Making it easier. Making, preparing the ground for vegans in a second stage. Because when we ask it now to people, it's very difficult and not many people do it. When we make it easier first, it will become so much um, faster to ask people to go vegan in a, in a second phase. So over time, the importance of the first approach diminishes and the importance of the second approach grows. So this would be like, um, suppose I give you two million dollars or two million euros to have a campaign on TV and you don't know who you're talking to. 
you don't know who you're listening to, who, who is listening to your message on TV. So it's a generic audience. It's the lowest common denominator. Then I would say, like, I would use this kind of approach, like about reduction, uh, mentioning all the reasons, or maybe mention health and environment, because those, those are the most popular reasons. Um, and uh, give a message of, like, not go vegan, but reduce, try vegetarian meals, uh, go meatless on this day or something, uh, or maybe go vegetarian at most, but not a go vegan approach. This is a leaflet by uh, Animal Equality, which some of you may know, one of the biggest animal rights organizations. It's the latest leaflet, and um, so it's making it make a difference why millions of people are changing the way they eat. And um, the word vegan doesn't occur in this um, in this uh, leaflet. And these uh, people, this organization works very much based on research. And uh, so research says that vegan at this point, for, for a lot of people, it's a scare word. It's a word like where they say, like, I'm not very comfortable. They're much more comfortable with uh, vegetarian or with reduction. So that's why they do this. But there's still room for like a, a very very ideological go vegan approach. Uh, we can we can use that with uh, audiences that are very open to it, audiences of vegetarians or people who are already reducing maybe, audiences of young people and students, people who are like philosophically inclined who want to like have a discussion about speciesism etc. It's completely okay to talk about veganism and speciesism and animal rights to them, uh, especially with young people I think. So let me, um, before I finish with something else, let me give you another um, idea of how this could work. So this is our present situation. The green uh, little people are the vegetarians or the vegans. The red ones are the meat eaters. So we have only a few percentages of uh, vegetarians, vegans. Um, so just 2% two, two vegans at most. So if we use only this approach, this go vegan approach, then we will have some more. Very slowly we will build this up. But at the same time, like I said, some people will just drop out again because the environment is still not there to um, help them with it. Um, so we will like go back to where we started, etc. But if you combine the go vegan approach with like a reduce approach, a reduce approach, and lowering the bar, making things easier in society and giving a lot of attention to the substitutes and all these things, then um, you would like get a lot of people to reduce. So these are like part-time vegetarians. And I think there's some degree of people, some amount of people, like let's say for instance, 70% of the people is 60% vegan. There has to be some number that tips the system. I don't know where it is, but I think this is the fastest way. That tips the system, that makes uh, all of these people in the end um, change further and further towards vegetarianism and veganism, and the remaining people will uh, succumb to the pressure of all these other people. And then the roles will be reversed, okay? And we will get the vegan world in the end. Um, yeah, I will skip this because I don't think it's time. Um, one, one very important thing, I think, is a very important strategy in all of this, is to change the default option. The default option is like the option you get, is like what you get when you don't do anything. So for instance, when, I don't know how it is in Sweden, but um, when you die, um, can, the people you, can other people use your organs um, if you don't say anything? Like the, the default option is like, if the default option is like, yes, people can uh, use my organs when I die, if that is the default option, you don't have to do anything, and there will be like 80% of the peop of the organs will be used. But when the default option is no, they can't, and you would have to like go to your like communality or like whatever to say like they can use my organs. So when you have to do extra effort to make them use it, then it will be much lower. Okay. So what we have to do, I think, and this is an example, on planes, for instance, the default option is a meat dish, and if you want vegan you have to um, register beforehand, go to the website, enter VGML, etc., and so that you get a vegan um, meal on the plane. But suppose it was the other way around. You're a mediator, you get on the plane, and you get served a vegetarian meal, and the waiter says, like, or the stewardess says, like, um, here's, your, here's your meal, and you say, like, as a meat eater, you say, like, what? I, I didn't order vegetarian. And she says, like, well, if you wanted meat, you should have told us beforehand. You know, you reverse the default option. Can you imagine how many more people would be on board or would do that, would change their behavior before they change their attitude? And the beautiful thing of this is that it doesn't require any forcing. People hate to be forced to eat a certain kind of way. They don't want to be forced. So this is not forcing, but it is like 
giving a really great pat in the back. This is um, what we did in, um, in with our organization in the schools in uh, in my town of Ghent. We um, reversed the option on Thursday, so we have Thursday Veggie Day, which is like a meatless Monday. So the this is like a campaign image. Little Red Riding Hood is not afraid of the wolf on Thursdays because uh, what we did was um, uh, we made sure that if the students didn't say anything or the parents didn't say anything. Uh, they would get vegetar a vegetarian meal on Thursday. And if they wanted meat, absolutely wanted meat, they had to ask for it. Uh, and as a result, 94% of the students eat uh, vegetarian on Thursday. Um, yeah. About This is the last part. Um, some things that I think will happen before we reach the vegan world and before meat eating becomes immoral. I think that meat may become too expensive for a lot of people. As more and more people eat it, the demand for grain will increase. There will be all kinds of issues that we have to take account, um, like environmental issues, animal welfare issues, that all make uh, meat more expensive and uh, make the system less profitable for farmers. Um, meat may become too risky. We have escaped um, diseases like big outbreaks now and then, like uh, Mexican flu and avian influenza, etc. Someday we may hit the big one, and then people might say, like, okay, this is way too dangerous. We cannot, we cannot keep doing this at least this intensive agriculture anymore. We have to change this. Meat may become redundant because uh, people experience that, like. Um, Great chefs do great things uh, with vegan food, or uh, this high-tech food will replace meat, and there will be no, be no more reason. And only then, when this is like so common and so easy to do, then meat becomes immoral, and then we would have this vegan world that we want. Thank you. I don't know if there's time for questions. If anybody has questions, I'll be happy to answer some, <coughs> if not. No questions. You agree with everything? You're very intelligent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yesterday I was talking in... Um, in Finland, and they uh, and two girls asked me what what I thought of Gary Yurovsky, and um, and I said like, well, yeah, he's a he's a problematic figure, and and they said like, well, he turned us vegan, and I said like, well, it depends what kind of vegans he turned you into, um, so um, I mean, he definitely problematic. It's 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 a hard thing to to. I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's about. I didn't I didn't show him here for to to, to advertise him or anything, uh, but um, I mean he. I don't know if everybody knows who he is. He's an activist, uh, and he has like this, the greatest talk you will ever see, or what is it called? Uh, the greatest speech you will ever hear. Um, and it has like two million or three million uh, people who've watched it. Um, and he's credited for veganizing Israel, etc. cetera. Um, but he's at the same time, he says like really disgusting things about uh, certain uh, populations, and um, he's like a misanthropic figure, et cetera. So yeah, um, he's problematic. On the other hand, like um, I guess nobody's perfect, and some people do good. So uh, pe most people do some good and some bad. And um, I wouldn't advertise him. And I, I, I personally, I don't like his style. Uh, yeah. <laughs>